I'm John Meyer, the CEO of Blue Microphones, and uh, we're excited to be here today with some very special guests. And, uh, and uh, thanks, DW, for letting us use their studio and some drums and stuff you're going to see in a second. Before we get started, I wanted to take just one minute to talk a little bit about Blue Microphones. Um, the company was founded uh, back in the mid-90s um, really with the idea of getting excellent quality sound, uh, but with a little bit of a unique design to it. And, and there's sort of two parts to that story that I want you guys to understand. The first is that uh, we really, really tried to, um, to have an opinion of sound. So we basically decided that, look, microphones color the sound. Um, and rather than try to make sound really flat through a microphone, we decided to embrace that idea and uh, essentially have our opinion of sound uh, coming from the microphone. So what you're going to hear today are a bunch of different microphones uh, that, uh, that do different things and have different personalities and different colors that work great for certain drums and great for other things. So that's the first part of it. But the second part is the actual design of the microphones. Uh, and some of that, we, we get accused a little bit of being uh, a little bit colorful, both in the names of the mics and, and the look and feel. Uh, but there's some function to that, uh, that design, and some of that you'll see too, like the ability to turn heads you know, in an overhead where you've got a perfect setup, uh, but the mic is not quite pointed at exactly the right place. Uh, we've got some interesting designs and ways that you can adjust that that we'll talk a little bit about too. Um, but what I'm really excited about is that we've got some great special guests, and we're going to talk a little bit about drums and getting good sounds before you even get the mics out of the mic locker. Uh, and then we're going to talk about mic placement and, and getting those sounds translated uh, onto tracks. Um, so the first, uh, first gentleman I'm going to introduce is Michael Blumpy Tuller. Michael, great producer and engineer, has done you know, so many things. Hard, hard to name them all, but a, a lot of stuff with Nine Inch Nails and Trent Reznor, um, uh, Third Eye Blind, uh, Vertical Horizon, a lot of movie stuff, like, uh, um, and I'm forgetting the names now. Uh, um, social, the social network, yep, social network, and a few others. Yeah. So, um, very excited to have him on board, and uh, really excited to have because I'm a drummer, so I'm I'm very biased. But uh, excited to have John J R Robinson with us, and uh, as you heard in the last ten minutes, um, John is just he's on everything. Basically, you grew up to just about every song. He's on the drums. So, without further ado, I'm going to have John uh, play a little bit for us, and then we'll start talking a little bit. Thanks, John.
awesome. Whew. Wow. They can hear the crowd roaring now <laughs> on the other side of the, the <laughs> monitor. That was great. Thanks, Thanks John. Great. Um, so, yeah, I think we want to just kind of talk a little bit about the drum sounds first. Like, you know, from your perspective, you know, walking into a studio, depending on the gig, and, you know, how are, how are you thinking about getting a drum sound that's going to work for the engineer? And then from your standpoint, Michael, what's... What are you looking for? And I know you've probably had that challenge where you don't have a John J.R. Robinson and you're trying to get a great drum sound and you sort of have to convince the drummer to go a certain direction. So how do you guys think about that? How do you work together on that, you know? Well, you want me to start or do you want to start? After you. Um, you know, my whole thing is I've been playing a very long time and, uh, f you know, 50 years. So, you know, when you're young and you're learning about sonics and uh, heads and quality of drums and cymbals, sometimes you don't really know until you get into situations and start working with A engineers. So it, from my perspective, it starts with great sounding drums. And um, I've been very blessed, you know, to, uh, to endorse the world's greatest drum company, uh, DW, and, um, and kind of been on the inside edge with John and Don and, uh, and developing drums for certain situations, but yet developing a drum set that I can literally bring in every day at a session. So this is basically my A studio set. You know, I start with a 24 inch bass drum and I have stock toms, 12, 13, uh, 16 and 18, but the floor toms are slightly smaller. So they have a, a bigger sound. And uh, today I'm using a, a beautiful brand new concrete snare. And of course my uh, personalized Peisty collection, including my uh, JR ride cymbal. Um, so I, I, I match my cymbals to my drums. And then I think the most important thing, and then before I get there, he's usually there. And he's already setting up his stuff and thinking about what kind of music we're doing. We're doing a, maybe, a, maybe a young pop rock kind of girl, or, or are we doing some sort of a little harder edge band or an R&B band? I'll start with a basic kit, and I'll usually leave everything wide open, except for the kick drum. The kick drum has kind of been my staple. So, uh, most of my music is kick drum oriented. So uh, I have that sound and, you know, um, Michael, will, he'll develop on his concept how to get that sound out. But then we'll go through, and I'm sure you have these in, in question form, you know, about <laughs> muffling and, and then yeah. choices. So basically it starts that way. Yeah. And, and from your perspective, you know, what, what are you looking for when you're walking in and, and doing a drum session? First thing I want to know is what kind of song we're recording, as you stated. And then what kind of room we need, because um, the room sound is, has a lot to do with what, how the drums are going to sound. It's the one instrument where the room plays a huge role. Uh, find the position for the drums uh, in that room. A lot of times you ask the assistant that. What, where's the best place for the drums? You've worked here 20 times. I've only, you know, it's, a good, it's a good question to ask the assistant um, or the house engineer. And then from there, it's the drums. You know, how good do the drums sound? If the drums sound great, you know, if you have some great mics, it's, it's going to be easy. Um, if you have a compromised drum set, well, you know, then you need, to, <laughs> you need to think about other things a little later on down the line, you know, as far as right. triggering and whatnot. Sometimes, you know, if you're doing uh, stylized kits or uh, junk mm -hmm. kits, trash kits, you know, it's... That can work. Yeah, yeah that can work. And, and you want a very even tone still. But it all comes down to the drummer because... A terrible drummer on a great kit isn't going to make it sing. It's, uh, you know, you need a great musician. And I was going to inter interject as that, uh, and then all that is important, but yet now what we have are these beautiful instruments on top of me, of these, these blue microphones. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the time I've been spending with them, I'm just, just overwhelmed. No, that's great. With, with the yeah. potential of what these mics give out of the gates, and then and, and the end results. So. Yeah. Well, and, and we're going to dive into a couple of things there because I want to ask you guys, you know, your opinion on a few things about mic placement and, and that stuff. But um, you talked a little bit about muffling. Like this kit right now, and in fact, for, for you guys uh, watching, what you're hearing is essentially uh, unprocessed, right? Where you're hearing the, the full mic kit, not the three mic kit, uh, unprocessed. And from your perspective, John, you're – it's all open, right? You don't have a lot of muffling going there's, on right now. No, there's no muffling except for the bass drum. I've, I've got, you know, got a packy blanket from 35 years ago yeah. that's laying very flat in there. 
that's some sort of superstition I've got. Yeah. But I mean, you know, as, as I'll show you, here's the kick drum by itself. I'm sure that's being sampled now all over the world. <laughs> that's fantastic. But, and then the toms, uh, I'm, I'm running wide open. I mean, come on, I, you know, I could probably, you know, bring down some walls just with that alone. And, and, and the snare drum with this new concrete snare, I'm basically running it wide open. But, you know, all I have to do is, I can easily muffle this, and with a beautiful DW mag throw-off, I can tighten this thing depending on what I want to do. Yeah. If I were to muffle these toms, I mean, it'd be very easy. And then, of course, it comes with a fine DW you can... I can tune any way I want to go. Yeah, so, yeah. And I think, song. you know, it's one of those things, too, where it, it's a choice, right? Because different songs are going to need different things. But I think a lot, of, a lot of people sort of assume they have to have this, you know, huge pillar on their bass drum and everything just completely muffled. And that's what impressed me the most walking in here today is that these things are wide open and listening in the, the control room, you know, just sounds record ready. It doesn't yeah. sound like it needs a bunch of muffling stuff. So, right. interesting. Um, Maybe let's switch to mics. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but uh, let's switch to microphones a little bit. And actually, you know, we know we got a great kit. We got a great player. We got great sounds. Um, you know, from your, your standpoint, Michael, what are you thinking about? Um, probably, again, song related, but as but, but far as mic placement and different types of setups. First thing I'm thinking about is the room and the overheads. Uh, in reality, a lot of mix engineers will trigger the kick drum and the snare drum, sometimes the toms, you know, just to stylize the song once the production is done. Sometimes they won't, or they'll blend the two. But what you want to record is the room with the drum kit as a whole, and, and a lot of that has to do with the overheads, obviously the room mics. Um, you want a nice even sound for the, for the overheads. You can do an XY position, which is you would switch. You would put these mics up close against each other, and then the left mic facing the right side and the right mic facing the left side and, Got it. and an XY. This is sort of a more traditional uh, uh, setup. Uh, here, right we, setup. we mic straight down because here's one half of the kit. And then his cymbal shop over here is, uh, is a little further. So we sort of angled it. But most importantly, it's, they're both the same distance from the snare drum because you want the snare drum. Yeah to be center. And that blatant plug here, this is what I was talking about with these mics, you know, the Dragonflies, we were talking about this earlier. Yeah, I love them. Great sounding mics, a lot of times you can actually kind of bring the rest of the kit down if you're getting a, a sweet sound out of the overheads. And um, we have a setup right now that is the three mic setup, and, and this is a package called the Drum Kit Kit. And uh, like that play on words, and uh, basically it's the, the mouse um, kind of in a room setup, right, for the, the, the bass drum. And then the dragonflies, sort of a matched pair of dragonflies for left and right. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you have any comments on that, but I think we should hear it too. So. This was my first time ever trying this, oh, and cool. I, I thought it was, it was amazing. I mean, it's, it, how natural, and yet it's got a thump to it. It's, it's a really cool mic sound. And, and this is something that, you know, was used back, I mean, a little bit of the John Bonham time. There's some three right. mic setups there, maybe with a snare mic, you know, snuck in. So there's some really cool sort of historical examples of this. Uh, and we just thought it'd be fun to put it in a package. So maybe play a little bit. Sure, on that's, that's, just, that's just this mic, the mouse, and then the two and, overheads. Yeah. Okay, I'll just play some simple time. As you can see, I mean, it feels fat as it is, and I've heard that <laughs> yeah. on playback already, and uh, highly impressed. So that's one method, obviously, and, and one of the things I mentioned earlier is that with the Dragonfly, you can direct uh, the microphone. So once you've got this big, heavy studio stand in place and you've done everything, it's an awful pain in the butt to have to do that all again when you realize it's not in the right place. And with these guys, this head actually rotates um, so you can kind of steer it correctly. That's brilliant. Yeah. So that, that's been that's a nice a great... little touch. So, um, 
what else? Like, let's go to the next step. You know, what, what, how do you think about the miking setup when you go into a session? Well, the, the room mics, you know, depending on the size of the room that you want to record, you know, judge the distance and what kind of sound you want. Um, a lot of times you may not even use them, but you may compress them. It's, you know, you, you want a good quality room mic, though, something that's got bottom to it. You don't want it too really on the high end. Uh, so nice, even, but still colored mic is nice. Um, and are we, I see some room mic, we got some uh, yes. bottle rockets here. Are we using rockets. those yes. right now? Okay. Yes. Um, this is a more dead room, even though it's, it's large, it's, it's a deader room. So it, they're not playing a huge role in the sound. Um, then the overheads, the overheads you don't want too high or else they become room mics. Um, but you also don't want them in the way of the drummer. And that's, you know, you have to have the drummer set up his, he has to be comfortable. If he's not comfortable, it's, it's not gonna work. Right, you don't want me really hitting those. No, but we don't want, <laughs> but, but you know what, if you hit them, they're durable. You didn't hit that. Though. No, I didn't. <laughs> but yeah, they're, you know, quite durable. Um, so like I said, on this kit, since he's so tall and everything extends so far over to the right, we angled the dragonfly over and this one's straight down. Usually I would do them both straight down, yeah. but since the snare, we want it centered. Got it's it. the same distance, but capturing a little more of the symbol. I must interject that all the great engineers I, I work with, including you, can basically get the drum sound out of those mics. That's it. I mean, and that's the real deal, you know. So um, that's, 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 uh, it, it, it takes a great kit the, and great drummer. Yeah, and it's <laughs> a sound yes. you're hearing too, right? It's like, it's sort of yeah. a mixed sound already. So. Yes, that's right. That's great. Um, and then, then you start thinking about individual mics. So in, in the three mic setup, we had the mouse for, not necessarily for just the kick drum, but that's capturing a lot of the low end, um, the subs that you're not gonna get necessarily in the overheads because they're right. going down. So you get the stereo and then the, the sub mono. Then when you expand to a full mic kit, like we have here, and if you're lucky enough to have so many Great yeah. microphones like, <laughs> like we do. Um, you know, you want to think about the kick drum, snare, toms. When I come into the studio and I'm, in a, I'm saying, hey, what's happening? Let's get ready to get a drum sound. I go, yes. So you ask okay. me to hit the kick yeah, drum. Yeah, you hit the kick drum, yeah. It's, so, I mean, it's, it starts with the sound check. It starts with low to high, yeah. uh, except for sometimes you'll go kick, snare, hat, and then groove. Yeah. And so I'm, you know, I'll just, basically for all, all you drummers out there, I'll... Just play quarter notes uh, simplistically at about a mezzo forte to forte uh, level because uh, Michael is setting his peaks because well, all of a sudden I hit it really hard. And, and yep. I've already done that in a take. He's, he's going to like go, uh, what are you doing? Like <laughs> so, you know, there's a, and that's yep. things I've learned ever since I was a younger uh, drummer. So. This is a fairly natural sound, like, like we said. Uh, Earlier, there's not a lot of processing going on here. It's basically the mics and mic pre's. I would sometimes add some compression depending on the style of the music, um, right. but that would come after the sound check. So we we check the sound. We have two microphones. Um, one is a dynamic mic that's got a nice low end to it. Uh, this you generally want. You if you want a really quick snap, you aim it towards the beater. If you want a little more. Low end and less snap, you aim it towards the, the corner. Somewhere from the middle of the kick drum towards the edge, um, towards the, the hole if you have one. Um, generally, I like, I like that. It's, uh, it, it has more high end. If, you're just, if there's just a full skin, then it's going to be right. really Let me interject basic. to that. Yes, please. A, lot of, a lot of you drummers out there, you, know, you see a lot of these rock, rock drummers with no hole in the kick drum. And... Uh, it's an amazing sound, it has a different feel to it, but yet, if you're going in and out of the studio all the time, it's better to accommodate the engineer to be able to get a mic inside the kick also. So that's yeah. just, a, and you don't have to have a very big hole, you know, kind of be a small enough hole, yeah. so you don't lose sound. Get pressure. some attack yeah. too, yeah. And, and so you've got, you've got the Encore 100, which is a dynamic, and then the mouse, which is a condenser, and are you, are you mixing, do you have kind of a routine you do, or is it different for every song and every bass drum? It's, know? It's different for every song and every bass drum. Uh, usually, you want a mic away from the hole to get the sub. The mouse is a great microphone with a lot of robust low end, and that's where I'm getting the sub from. Got it. Um, sometimes I will put it in front of the hole with a pop filter so I don't blow the capsule. Right. Um, 
generally speaking, you have to move it back and forth till you get it in phase. And the way I do that on the console is I throw the mics out of phase mm -hmm. and adjust the microphone until it's out of phase, then pop it back in. Oh, great. Um, so then you know you have it in phase. And yeah. so. Right. Uh, and sometimes if, if I put the mouse in front of the hole, I'll put a, a low pass filter on it. So I'll roll off all the high end mm -hmm. and then squash it. Yeah, like a compressor. Just get all the low end going. So great. You're, you're, you're giving away your tricks. Yeah, right. Not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Saving a yeah. few. Yeah. So um, a snare drum. You got three mics on that, and this is a special snare drum, right? This is a concrete. This snare is drum. a new, uh, uh, a concrete snare drum. John Good built, and um, I've been hearing rave things about it. So I asked very nicely on my knees if I could have one, and here it is, and it is quite brazen. I must be honest. Uh, I've been using DW snares for many, many years now. And uh, again, it's out of the gates, unmuffled, and it's not too, for you, all you guys who are tuning, it's kind of medium, medium high. It's not real deep. And I know for a six and a half inch by 14, this will go really deep. And I know for a fact, this thing will crank really high. So I came out of the gates and um, I'll just, I'll get, I'll get sounds with you. I'll usually start by getting sounds in the middle of the snare, and then I'll do rim shots later. So, so he's, at least he's seeing his attack on the VU meters. So I'll go like that. And then I'll go. And then the very last, before we really commit to a drum sound, I'll get a cross stick sound. Because there are times when then, oh, I'm not hearing enough of, of the attack or the brightness. And then uh, he'll go in and adjust that. So now you've got uh, two beautiful mics up here. Yes. Two mics on top, one on the bottom. Condenser mic for quick, quick snap attack. Uh, a lot of times I'll compress that with, uh, I'll accentuate that snap by having compression dips down maybe minus four on the threshold and about 10 milliseconds on the attack, as quick of a release as possible. So that's got the snap, that's got the, the initial crack. And then the other microphone is a dynamic. That's uh, a phantom power dynamic, uh, the Encore 200. Right. Um, and that's got a, a nice robust tone to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that fills in mm -hmm. the, the snap. Um, you don't need, you can use one or the other, to be honest, they, they both sound fantastic. But a lot of times that's my processing is to have right. two mics. Uh, and then on the bottom. And then on the bottom, uh, got a, a dynamic mic, and that's uh, the 100i. It's got a very directional um, point, which I like. Uh, it's miking the snares. It also has a lot of the low end that you're looking for in the drum. So, so you'll do some sort of mix of that setup to yes. get the right sound. Uh, although in, in the DAW world, I, don't sep I used to mix them all together into one track. This is when they had something called tape machines. <laughs> There was this, what? What? It was, they glued metal onto plastic <laughs> wow. and they would, yeah, magnetize the particles and, and it would razor run across. blades to edit. Razor we edit blades. Yeah, we would edit with razor. So now we have Beat Detective and we have DAW. So I record everything to its, every mic goes to its, to its own track um, because. You can. Yeah, 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 because you can. And it, yeah, you're mixing. I, I have a question about your top phase issue. Mm hmm. Well, how do you deal with that, if, uh, or is there any? The same way. Uh, yeah, it's the throw kitchen. one out of phase, make sure it's, yeah, make sure it's in phase. If you put them really close together and they're pointed to the same spot, you're, yeah. You know. the, the thing about the snare drum is you want to point towards the middle. There's, right. a, there's usually a nice little dot here. Um, you want to aim towards that. Um, and you want the rejection point from the hi-hat, the cymbals, so all the microphones for, for the drums are pointed towards the drummer, not, you know, you don't want to... The other, yeah. Yeah, you don't want a yeah. snare mic here, miking that ride or, you know, it's yeah. pointed so, towards the drummer and then across the skin. You want it basically two or three fingers. Uh, if you want more proximity, you come closer and they'll have, it'll have more low end. It's yeah. an unnatural low end and the mic might get a little more. A lot of microphones, if it gets a... Pri the, the, <laughs> Proximity effect from being too close, they'll start turning omnidirectional, which is something you don't want. No. So you want to have a little bit of space for the impact. Um, right. So, and, and for those keeping score at home, we've got an Encore 100i, I think, on, underneath, yes. right? And then an Encore 200, an Encore 300 on top. Right. Um, so 
Would you move to Tom's next, or would you start doing hi hat and groove? I or? would. I would move to hi hat next. Okay. And I would believe uh, he would too. And and uh, that's exactly what we did today. Yeah. And and I think the reason why is uh, and what do we have up here? One hundred. Yes. So I mean, I, and I'll do the same thing. Uh, I'm using some very bright but full 16-inch uh, sound edge by Paiste. So I'll just get a simple, simple sound and then I'll open it up so he feels the entire hi-hats open up and shut. So I'll just do... You know, in a lot of today's music over the last almost 10 to 15 years, is a lot of drummers have been, instead of bashing on crash cymbals, they, they'll just, they'll play... Play their grooves on open hi-hats, mm -hmm. you know. So it's basically a huge wash of the music. Because we got to keep up with the guitar player. <laughs> <Right. laughs> And um, that's kind of what it's all about. Um, um, and then... Microphone you want, you know. Good, you don't want it in the way, you want it, you want it mic towards the center, not the edge. It I've had some too. engineers try to place it in here, and if I start <laughs> to go into uh, yeah, dual-handed 16s, I'm like literally on it. I go, you don't want me to do that. Stay <laughs> out of the way, yeah. And yeah it's, I do all the drum, at least for the monitors, it has to be in drum, drummer's perspective. Um, a lot of drummers just want to hear kick drum. In there. What, explain that a little further, from drummer's perspective. Drummer's perspective is hi-hat is on, on your left. That's right. It's, in, it's what the direction is, how he has the setup. There you go. Um, for stage, obviously, you're mixing from audience perspective. So if your hi-hat is on your left, it's on the right, and that's where you would... That's where you would place everything. For for records, I don't do live sound. So for records, I always do drummer's You're perspective from the beginning to end. In in the driver's the, the listeners in the band. Yes, that, the absolutely, kit, absolutely. And and to be honest, anytime I hear it the other way on a record, it drives me insane. Yeah, me too. I I don't know why, but I always have to hear things in drummer's perspective. Uh, so, are you doing um, when you're checking the hi hat? Um, are you doing the overheads yet, or are you just trying to get the close mics? Just doing point? the, just getting the hi hat by it. itself, okay. and for a low pass filter or right. a high pass filter on okay. it. So, um, so we got that, and now we're moving to Tom's, right? Yes. Well, actually, uh, what he would ask me is just, just to play. I mean, did we go to Tom's next? We did. We, we went to this rack one. one. You yeah. play a groove a lot of times. We've done it well. Yeah, a lot of times. So then we went to the Tom's, uh, and I will always start with the high tom and just play again quarter notes. And let's go. And I'll try to be as natural as possible and not, not go like that or some weird, stupid thing. And, and then he'll say, move on to two, and then he'll say, move to three, and then move to four, and then play all. So and he's doing his pans, and he's, and he's getting his EQs right, and to make sure that all the mics are speaking semi-equally, right? Yes. And as far as miking goes, uh, I always use a conden condenser mic. Uh, I fell in love with the baby bottles for toms. They're very simple. They sound phenomenal on toms. Uh, every tom I've mic'd, it sounds great on. Uh, the rack toms, it's sort of like the snare drum where you, you're aiming towards the middle, but with the rack toms, I tend to aim them down a little more. Uh, you'll get more harmonics that way, uh, and you'll get less of the, the, the sub ring. Uh, they tend to ring too much if you do that. It's the exact opposite of the floor toms, where the floor toms, I'm aiming for the center. If I aim it down more, it's going to ring way too much. Right. So, uh, but you, you'll generally adjust them. Today, I, I played with the rack toms towards the center. Didn't like it. Went back to placing them down. That's that's a key. Is you got to experiment. Experimenting, yeah. and whenever I do toms, I always uh, on the post. DAW side of it, I put dynamic processing, um, a, yeah. uh, a gate, just to keep, you know, symbols and everything out of the, t you know, you generally want the toms louder, and if everything's ringing in the tom mics, it'll, it messes you know, up your mix. It messes you're, you're up. You're basically mix, turning so. everything up at that point. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. And then uh, we're on to symbols, right? At that point, um, or if, or do you play a little bit with that? At that point, he'll say, just play a groove or play the whole kit, and, and instead of. You know, I've uh, I've seen other drummers get sound checks or, or drum sounds, and a lot of guys are just frantic, oh. kind of like my opening <laughs> solo. I do the exact opposite of that because there's really no common denominator. So I'll play just a simple groove, you know. Actually, I just call it the money groove because 
make lots of money, make lots of money. Anyway, what he'll do is he'll be, he'll solo, he'll just have these up mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. there, and that's his kit sound. And he's, once he feels that that's, correct me if I'm wrong, that's comfortable to you, then you're going to throw in the kick and the snare and the hi-hat. Yep. Let's do one more shot at the, the full mic setup. There we go. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so um, before we do Q and A, um, any more commentary about sort of how to how to work in a session? Because whether it's in a studio or whether it's your band uh, and you're the engineers, or whether you're you know using your first engineer setup, um, any more sort of advice for these guys about you know uh, from the drummer's perspective, from the engineer's perspective. You know, maybe some war stories, you know, something where you've come in and had an experience that just was hard to have the session work because of the engineer, and oh. you've had a session where the drummer just basically wouldn't cooperate. I mean, it'd be fun to hear some some well, of your We obviously get along, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, as a drummer, and you come into the, the studio the first time, he's your best friend. You know, I'm, of course, you know, the producer and whatever, but, I mean, if him as an engineer title, uh, he's your best friend because you're going to come in here with your thing and your attitude and your concept, and you, you're going to want to convey that to digital now, not tape. <laughs> and uh, you need to work through him. And I have a, you know, when I first joined Rufus uh, in 1978, um, I, I worked with an engineer named Roy Halley, famous engineer from New York, uh, did uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water, Simon and Garfunkel's engineer. Um, I was coming off of playing live forever as an 18, 19 year old. And so I just absorbed an amazing amount of energy. And when you transfer that into the studio, that too much energy overloaded the mic pressure. And he would come out and, um, you know, microphones have come a long way since then, but he would come out and say, you know, you're overloading the mics, you're playing too hard, you're playing too hard. So you have to kind of, kind of bring that back, back in. Off. And, uh, he taught me a very valuable lesson, as did Bruce Wedeen in the old days, about mic, mic level and not, not playing that hard and, and letting the mics do the work. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's, that, that was something that, as an 18 to 21-year-old, I didn't quite get right out of the gate. So, so I, was, uh, I listened to the engineer. You know, he has a lot to say. And so then you work on the concept of the sound, and if he may say, you know, man, I, you got to bring your snare drum up a pitch, and you know, you might be thinking inside that no, it's pretty cool there, but no, no, he's hearing something different that I'm hearing. Let's go with it, and and let's do it. So keep you an know? open mind, and you know, not, don't be so attached to your thing. You that's know? right, yeah. totally open mind, because what what you guys you you're becoming one, and that's the 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 whole goal is to get a get a hit record or a, a great sounding record. Yeah, yeah. So. How about from your perspective, Mike? What's uh, well, war stories, huh? <laughs> no, I, I, absolutely, the, the drummer is the, the most important thing there because if he can't play the part, if he can't, you know, that's you can't work with, you can't get the sound. It, out yes, of his exactly. Kit, and know? then the finesse of the drummer. Right? There's a lot of drummers that hit the crashes harder than they hit the rest of the drums, and that's a uh, that's always a problem. And that's sometimes that's the. I mean, sometimes I do this even for, with great drummers, but it's a no cymbal take. Okay, here's a right. blanket, play this, and you're getting the drums in the room wide open. So you, you get a nice high end that way too. Um, but sometimes the drummers can't. There's a record, uh, I forget the name of it, but a Peter Gabriel record that he had Phil Collins play on yes. and took all the cymbals away. Yes. And great record, but as a drummer, you listen to that and you're just like, where are the, there's no cymbals, not on one tune well, in that record. Well, Quincy Jones, the dude, 
I came in, Lukather's in the band, I, I, I don't know who else is, Abe Sr. was playing bass, and uh, Greg Finley Gates. And I came in on day two, you know, I had my set set up, and we're kind of baffled up and stuff, but I had everything there. And I came in the day two, and Lukather's standing there laughing at my drums. <laughs> I go, what are you laughing at? And he goes, look. And I peek over, and nothing's there but a kick, a snare, and a hi-hat. <laughs> and Bruce Swedeen comes out, and he goes, Quincy doesn't want any toms on this record. And Whoa. I go, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, so I was like, I, you know, I, that's a good war story. Cause yeah, exactly. Six Grammys. But. Um, I'm going to bring Brandon back on, and, uh, you know, obviously thank Guitar Center for, uh, for putting this on for us. And, uh, no, thank JR you guys. This was, and, uh, yeah. this was one of the first times that I got to sit back and let you guys really take it, and it's just really enlightening to see uh, the opinions of some of some some people who've just got so much experience in the business. So, thank thank you guys. For, right. You know, thanks everybody for being here. Thank you, Drum Channel. Um, thank you, DW. Thanks, Blue, of course, and and Michael and and Jr. Thank you for your time. I know time is time is valuable. So thank you guys. I hope everybody enjoyed this Music Mentor Series webinar. Thanks for being here. <laughs> <laughs>